2007 was one of the most influential years on the gaming industry, as it not only showcased a number of major franchise releases, but also a number of first-person shooters as well. Call of Duty 4 made its transition from the World War era to modern warfare, marking a major turning point in the game's direction. Valve brought a multitude of different gameplay narratives, ranging from the class-based shooter of Team Fortress 2 to having players think outside the box with Portal. Halo 3 marked the end of Bungie's trilogy, with a farewell to Master Chief's campaign along with some multiplayer mayhem. And let's not forget Crisis, which was very much well known for shaming your graphics card. It was indeed a year that celebrated a wide variety of games whose influences have shaped the modern FPS landscape. Among that wide variety was Bioshock. Released in August of 2007 for the Xbox 360 and PC, it was a shooter that blended FPS action with RPG elements. It was designed as a spiritual successor to System Shock 2, a sci-fi FPS game with classical RPG and even horror elements. While Bioshock borrows many of its predecessor's design mechanics, along with improved technicalities and better game feel, it was also meant to be accessible for a newer audience, as well as the console generation audience, with a more approachable design to its light RPG elements. Upon release, it was highly received on many different fronts, from its gameplay, story, and presentation. The game gave players a variety of methods to handle combat in Rapture. Different weapons, ammo types, and upgrades allowed for a number of ways to handle the many different enemies that dwell in the underwater city. Its plasmids also let players use a variety of grotesque but powerful abilities that enhanced their combat capabilities. The game's premise and story was highly praised for its dark themes and mysterious narrative, along with a host of intriguing and memorable characters who gave the world of Rapture its dystopian and ruinous setting. Bioshock was not only successful, it saw a direct sequel that put you in the shoes of a big daddy, as well as a third game that let you traverse the city of Columbia to bring someone a girl and wipe away the debt. The franchise itself has seen much success among its sequel iterations, but Bioshock is often regarded as one of the greatest single-player FPS experiences of all time. But how does the first Bioshock feel to play today? The franchise itself is more than 10 years old now, and the sequels that came after it have seen many improvements that the first game had made. Columbia itself, in terms of level design, improved the openness and layout, making the city feel much more grand and, well, feeling like an actual city when compared to Rapture. Bioshock 2 even improved the combat, allowing the player to utilize both plasmid and weapons on screen without the need to switch between the two, making it much more intuitive and visceral. Outside of the series, a wide variety of FPS games have shifted focus to make the single-player aspect feel more interesting and fun, like open-world utilization, roguelites, or just a simple emphasis on faster combat and boomer shooting. So with the current landscape of FPS games and the many titles that you can choose from, does the first Bioshock still feel fun to play in this day and age? Is Rapture perhaps still worth taking a bathysphere to, just to see the world of Andrew Ryan? Well, let's take a look, would you kindly? The story of Bioshock is a complex mystery. Set in the backdrop of post-World War II, you play as a seemingly unknown male protagonist that has crash-landed in the middle of the Atlantic, only to find that your only source of salvation is a lighthouse in the middle of the ocean. Upon investigation, this leads the player to Rapture, a city built by Andrew Ryan that was meant to serve as a haven from the restraints of political ideologies, religion, and governments across the world, allowing any individual to pursue their own ambition and find success. However, this attempt at a utopian society brings about its eventual downfall, and Andrew Ryan is at the epicenter of its constant power struggle to stay afloat. You, the player, must survive and escape Rapture while unearthing its secrets and uncovering the mystery of its inhabitants, including yourself. By far, the setting of Bioshock is definitely the strongest element in the entire game, and still is. Almost all of it is conveyed through the cast of characters and how they present themselves against Rapture's backdrop, either in direct radio conversation with the player or through their tape recordings. The complexity of each of them provides a multitude of different ideologies and perspectives that you could spend hours and hours trying to psychoanalyze just what the character represents. Coming back to the setting of Rapture honestly felt like I was rereading thematic dystopia novels like 1984 or Brave New World, and how the societies in those books affect the characters that live in them. Learning about their motives, intentions, and ambitions, especially in the different periods of Rapture's history, was still intriguing and engrossing to listen to after all these years. 
I think part of why I enjoyed listening to them again was, well, partly me getting older with a slight bit of nostalgia, but also reanalyzing the characters themselves. From looking at Bridget Tannenbaum's history as a World War II survivor and her creation of the Little Sister program, Sander Cohen and his unhinged personality with trying to perfect his art, or Frank Fontaine trying to get his upstart and rival that of Andrew Ryan, there are many different intrigues and inquiries you could find behind each of these characters. I think part of what aged well with the design of the storytelling is the protagonist. You have the benefit of being a mute who is very good at listening to people and somehow good at killing them as well, but also very bad at conversing and talking back. In fact, you only have speaking lines at the beginning of the game and a few grunts here and there, but your lack of dialogue and conversation is what lets the player feel any sense of attachment to the character monologues. Sure, it's at the behest of the protagonist lacking any character whatsoever, but it also makes it more meaningful by treating the player as if they are the protagonist, letting them make their own judgment of the world as they take it in. It's what also sets this game apart from its infinite sequel, where Booker DeWitt plays more like an actual named character with his own dialogue and voice, whereas the Bioshock protagonist aims to be more of the player through silence. I think the only case in the story that might not hold up for some players is the binary choice you make with getting a good or bad ending, mainly because you don't really get any other option to do so. You're either the good guy that saves all of the little sisters, or you're the bad guy that harvests them. Of course, it could be argued that there are thematic and story reasons for why the game has to end this way, but I think some players will find that the lack of choice that they can make on the story might be a little on the boring side. In any case though, the story and narrative style of Bioshock holds up extremely well. On the gameplay side of things, you're pretty much in a variety of different flavors of combat alongside a bit of exploring and finding Rapture's secrets. From using the many different weapons and plasmids to eliminate enemies, hacking security devices and machines to make your life easier, exploring nooks and crannies to find secret loot as well as tapes, there are many different things to do while you're sightseeing in Rapture. I think the weapon variety that the game provides you with still made the combat portion of this game fun to play. Sure, this design of using different weapons and abilities traces back to old school style shooters, but it's a design that gives the player the freedom of choice and letting them go about combat in their own way. Using weapons at specific ranges, setting up traps for an ambush, even choosing the type of ammo to use on certain enemies helps tailor the combat situation in your favor. Likewise, the choice of plasmids still felt varied enough that you can pick your favorite setup. Using Electro Bolt and using your wrench to combo an enemy to death, blowing up enemies by setting red barrels on fire, or giving someone the Wicker Man treatment and letting them be horribly stung by bees. You have the option to go into specific styles and even select the type of passive upgrades you want without the need to commit to things like stat allocation. A light RPG of sorts, and not so heavy that you have to think about it too hard. Even though maybe there could have been more creative and grotesque plasmids beyond what the game provides, it felt sufficient enough that the options were satisfying without feeling like there needed to be more. The hacking is the other gameplay aspect of Bioshock, which you can use on various security devices to turn them into friendly sentries and turrets, or to discount items on various vending machines. In terms of gameplay, the pipe mania-like minigame, in which you connect two junction points with a set of pipes, was still fun and simple, and it always seemed to tick the inner speedrunner and min-maxer portion of my brain. The benefits of cheaper items and automated defenses was always a useful option towards combat, and this gameplay aspect held up for me in this sense. Exploring Rapture's nooks and crannies also felt fun to do. You're usually exploring through rooms and looking through every cupboard and shelf in order to find resources, but it can get more complicated when you have to find hidden areas that you need to explore in order to get to. You're often rewarded with more resources as well as harder to find ones, and you'll also find hidden tapes and plasmids on occasion. It was enough to tickle the collectathon and secret finding mentality in my brain, so it was always fun to explore. But your mileage may vary with how much you want to collect. I think part of what makes the overall gameplay hold up is the level design. Areas will often contain varying degrees of space, environmental interactions, and hazards that you can use to your advantage. A tight corridor, for example, can be used to set up traps for enemies to run through. An area that's full of water means that a carefully placed electrobolt can defeat enemies with minimal effort. 
security devices in a crowded area means that you can take a bathroom break without having to pause the game. The way levels are set up helps provide potential situations for the player to utilize for greater combat effect, and it always felt rewarding to creatively use them in order to make the situations less stressful, as well as minimizing how much resources you use. Though not everything on the gameplay front quite held up. The risk of dying is almost non-existent in this game, thanks to the Vita Chambers taking away the punishment for dying. It honestly felt a little too easy sometimes when I was trying to finish combat. Having to switch between gun and plasmids feels a bit clunky to do in combat, not to mention assigning plasmids is not the most pleasant experience. Finally, the overall feel of shooting doesn't feel as refined as it could be, and the movement and controls feel a bit clunky. A bit minor to me on my revisit because I was able to adjust accordingly and pretty much just deal with it, but these could be issues to you if you're not too keen on combating the game's logistics. Enemy types among the splicers also starts to get a bit samey, with only the big daddies acting as the other enemy variant in the entire game. Not to mention that there's only two big daddy variants, the Rosie and the Bouncer, so enemy variety is a bit lacking. The only other minor technical issue I had on gameplay was my mouse. The game has a weird mouse input registration that makes it feel like you're controlling an analog stick. It was present during the introduction of the game, as well as when you load into the game from the menu. But this immediately fixed itself as soon as I got my first wrench, and when you would re-exit from the pause menu. It probably has something to do with the game itself being a console port, but thankfully it never affected me throughout the playthrough. Overall though, the gameplay still felt fun, and the options that players get to have to vary combat and explore still hold up. The presentation is still pretty good on both the visual and sound front. When it comes to the look of Rapture, you pretty much know it's Rapture. The underwater city backdrop, the dilapidated areas of a once brimming city, the mutated and warped denizens of Rapture, the big daddies and little sisters, the pneumatic system of the doors, the steampunk inspired aesthetic, all of them designed and distinct to Bioshock. Even with the 17 year age of the game, the overall art style and direction never feels dated, and if anything, adds to the 60s feel that the game tries to portray, not to mention adding to some of the horror themed elements as well. Splicers for example look grotesque, with their disfigured faces, and there's enough variation in the models to make them look different from one another, even amongst the different splicer types. The iconic looking big daddies feel hulkish and brutish, and it's very hard to miss them when they're walking within or outside of Rapture. The various parts of the city offer different locale locations from high-class outlets, dank fisheries, metallic engineering suites, glass bridgeways, all make the dilapidated underwater city of Rapture feel once prosperous but also industrious. Some design choices in the world also reveal some tidbits of story as you go through them. The shaders also add to the game's dark and creepy atmosphere, especially when the game does try to emphasize the lighting in certain areas. While generally a darkly looking game, the lights that occasionally cast shadow in smaller areas really make the environment feel claustrophobic and eerie. One small technicality that feels awkward to see is that some models feel like they're operating at a lower frame rate. Considering that Bioshock was designed around console usage at 30 frames per second, the models and objects sometimes move at this speed when physics is involved. You can see this when models ragdoll or when the security bots are flying about. It didn't affect me gameplay wise, but it does look a bit awkward when you're operating at 60 frames per second. Of course, the engine is on the older side, and the character models and environments can sometimes feel a bit blocky, and they do lack some of the more ultra-fine details that more modern games tend to have. But the overall aesthetic was always more than appropriate to showcase the game. Despite the 17 year age, the disheveled state of Rapture continues to look and feel disheveled even today. The sound effects have held up quite well and still sound really natural to Rapture. Bioshock knows how to make its sounds feel distinct from all of the different sources. Outside of the more run-of-the-mill sounds that you'll be hearing, more distinct sounds like the Big Daddy's footsteps feel heavy and imposing as they approach you.
There's also different sound effects with the type of ammo that you use to let you know that they are distinct from one another. The sound effects are really good, and Bioshock is very keen on letting you know how distinct the sounds are from one another. The music is also the biggest mood setter for the entire game. You'll hear a multitude of different period pieces from the Ink Spots, Bing Crosby, Billy Holiday, all used to establish the era in which Rapture takes place in. It also serves as an ironic backdrop of pleasantness, despite the violence that surrounds Rapture, similar to how the modern Fallout series uses music in the Radiated Wasteland. Outside of the licensed tracks, you'll occasionally hear music during specific sections of the game, and they still do a good job of adding tension and uneasiness during certain scenes of gameplay. You'll also hear carnival-like chimes and musical notes from the numerous vending machines scattered throughout Rapture. Welcome to the Circus of Values! The voice acting is undoubtedly still the best part of the game on the sound front. Even when you're only hearing the characters through recorded messages and the occasional direct line of communication, and the fact that it's going through an old staticky radio filter, the personalities and emotions can be felt through each of the characters' monologues and anecdotes. Why are you so resistant to the traditional methods of separating a man from his soul? You're not CIA, are you? You belong to Atlas. It's my curse, my eternal curse. I want to take the ears off, but I can't. It's my curse, it's my fucking curse. I want to take the ears off, please. We saw our Nasha today. We barely recognize her. That's her sunset. You're crazy, I tell them. That thing? This, this is our the credit goes to both the sound directing and the voice actors for making the personalities of each of the character feel like real individuals. Even outside the characters, the enemy splicers have spoken lines and dialogue that give them some personality. I traded you, O oh Lord, for Mammon. And what did it get me, huh? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. Say. There are a few issues though, with certain sounds cutting in and out. In game sound will sometimes be muted, and you won't even notice that there's an enemy hurting you until your life bar is gone, or the sound finally cuts back in. A technical issue for sure, but it only ever affected my gameplay once out of every combat that I encountered. Overall, the sound and music are great, and Rapture still sounds like the dystopian city that it is. So after finally coming back to Rapture and adopting a bunch of little sisters, Bioshock still manages to feel fun. There is a bit of age when it comes to the feel and technicalities of the game, but the story and gameplay variety still manage to outpace those issues. Of course, it's not the flashiest in terms of its movement and gameplay, and neither is it the most deeply mechanical in its RPG elements, but it still manages to achieve a nice middle ground of both that make it uniquely Bioshock. Sure, the sequels improved upon the feel of the game and some of its design elements, but it's hard not to argue seeing the city of Rapture in its first incarnation. The characters, the locations, the history behind the city is a sad tale, but it's what makes Rapture so engrossing to go through. I think what also helps Bioshock age well is that there hasn't really been any other single player shooter, outside of its franchise and maybe an indie title, that has tried to replicate or evolve the specific FPS RPG niche that Bioshock, or even System Shock 2, carved for itself. Whether you want to play it again for nostalgia's sake, or maybe it's your first time visiting Rapture, Bioshock manages to still hold its own 17 years later, and it's definitely still fun to play. Thanks for tuning in everyone! The City of Rapture has been fun to go back to, and I think I'll eventually revisit the second game as well as Infinite. But for now, I'll see you all next time.